I want to turn to uh, a little verse found in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, which introduces something of the theme of our service for this morning. Peter, in uh, explaining himself and preaching his, his word, he says to the crowd, not the crowd on the day of Pentecost, but a subsequent crowd this. Salvation, he said, is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to humankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is the name that is above every other name. And what I'd like to start with this morning is a hymn uh, written by Timothy Dudley Smith some years ago. It's quite a modern hymn. It's called Name of All Majesty, and it exalts and magnifies that name in whom our salvation is found. Name. Now, you may wonder why I'm popping around up here. Originally, Tom was going to be playing, but he's full of cold. Uh, uh, sympathy vote there coming from Pete, but not from Sandra, I know. Oh, poor, poor Sandra, all right. So, uh, Tom's got a cold, so do pray for Sandra, okay. <laughs> We're going to uh, have a little game of oh, oh, oh. When was the last time you played oh, oh, oh? That's an old one. It's called Odd Ones Out, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Odd Ones Out. So, we're going to see some faces on the screen, and I would like you to spot who might be the Odd One Out. Anybody got any ideas? Who are they? Who are they? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, they're all called Alan except one, George Alagaya, the newsreader. So from left to right, you've got Alan Sugar, the next one, normally known as A.A. A. Milne, the writer of Winnie the Pooh, but his first name was Alan, then Alan Davis, and then Alan Titchmarsh, Alan Hansen, the football pundit, and Alan Shearer, who used to be number nine for Newcastle, those of the Newcastle, the Newcastle shirt, and then also captain of England. So they're all... Alan's except uh, George. And um, 
good move. Then I thought, oh, well, it's about time I looked up what the name Alan actually uh, means. Um, and uh, from the Breton, it means handsome. <laughs> there are other alternative explanations according <laughs> to the internet, but I think I found the one I liked, and when I told Helen, she said I couldn't agree more. I just made that up, by the way. She didn't say that at all. Okay, let's have a look at the next lot. Can't see from there. Yes, let me look in. Anybody can know? The odd ones out. There's more than one odd out. There are three that are odd out. Yeah. <laughs> now then, all of them, except the bottom three, who are actors who played Helen of Troy, um, and their first name is not Helen. Helen, the top left, was the first uh, British astronaut. And then there's Helen, who in a soap opera that I can never remember, was it Crossroads? <laughs> Coronation Street, never heard of it. She played, she, I mustn't tell so many fibs, should I? Um, she played Gale, did she not? Even I remember that. And then her dame, Helen Mirren, of course. And then there's another Helen who played somebody else in Call the Midwife. Anybody know what her name is in Call the Midwife? Who? Chi Chi. Trixie. Trixie. So there we are. So I then looked up what the name Helen means. And if. <laughs> I then looked up what the name Helen means. And it comes from three Greek words. So it could mean light or sunshine or even a bright moon. All of which tells me that. Somebody called Helen is the light of my life. Oh. And I love her dearly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I, was, I was hoping for brownie points off that one. We'll move on. Then I decided to look up what the most popular names for boys and girls were last year in 2021. And that's according to a website called uh, Baby Center. They're coming up. And in brackets on the right, you'll see whether the name has moved up or down in popularity. So that's Mohammed, Noah, Oliver, George Upfree, Leo, Theo, Freddy, Harry, Jack, and Arthur, which is down six. So, uh, the, the name Alan didn't make it into the top 100. Aww. For girls, the names are Olivia, uh, Sophia, 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 Lily, Amelia, Ava, Mia, Isla, Freya, Ella, and Rosie, which comes in plus six, those names coming up there. And once again, I discovered, it says to be fair, that Helen doesn't come in the top 100 um, either. So, you know, we've got classic names there, haven't we, obviously, because there's a lot of the classic names weren't there. So, yes, I was quite surprised by some of those, um, but those are apparently the names that are, how to put these days, the names that are trending uh, about the place. But still on the theme of names, let me draw three scriptures to your attention. Uh, first of all, from Isaiah uh, 43 and verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. All right, so we've had a bit of fun with names. The Lord knows your name. He knew your name before you were conceived, before you were born. And he has loved you and me with an everlasting love. This is what the Lord says. Do not fear. Somebody else said, I haven't double checked it, but the phrase do not fear or do not be afraid occurs 365 times in the Bible. One for each day. John 10 and verse 3. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
Our final uh, song this morning will be the Lord's my shepherd and I will trust and trust in him alone. Um, the word shepherd, you could also translate that as pastor. So you could have the Lord is my pastor. or you know, it, The words are interchangeable. It just gives a different ring to it, doesn't it? Um, the, the great shepherd of the sheep, as the apostle Peter, the great pastor of the sheep. And he is someone to whom all of us, who sometimes like sheep go astray, can turn. And he will rescue, save, deliver, and lead us by streams of living water. The Lord knows our names. Revelation 21 and verse 27, nothing unique will ever into it. This is now the recreation of the heavens and the earth. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only names whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Do you know what? When I get to glory, I'd, I'd ask if I could have a little look at that, make sure my surname is spelled correctly. You know. <laughs> Just to see my name there, yeah? And scripture also talks about his name written on the palm of his hands. And one of the things that uh, a thought that sometimes blows me away at Easter time is to think that when Jesus died upon the cross, at the moment of his death, my name was pulsating, beating in the Father's heart in heaven. This is for you, Alan. This is for you, Jenny. This is for you, Kerry. Your name. I mean, God can multitask. And how we can think of all the names of is redeemed in that moment, I don't know. But it's a thought that wows me every time I think of it. When he declared, it is finished, brackets, for you, Alan, for you. Because he knows us all by name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you know us by name. Before we were conceived, before we were born, you knew us, you called us, you shaped us, you knit us together in our mother's wombs. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you that you created us in your image, that we might know friendship and fellowship with you, sharing in your life for you alone our life. And we thank you that in giving your son at his birth the name Jesus, it was so that he could save us from our sins because our sins had come between you and ourselves. We thank you that through Jesus, through his life, through his death on the cross, through his resurrection, the ascension, and his sure return in power and glory, our sins are forgiven. The gift of righteousness is ours. And you have emblazoned our names in the heavens itself because we are now in Jesus. How can we, Lord, how can we ever thank you enough? And we pray that by your spirit, you would open our eyes to see the wonder and the glory, the majesty of it all, so that we are humbled before you with a sense of awe and worship and thanksgiving. For the name of Jesus, we thank you. We ask that his name will be honoured in our worship, his name will be honoured in our words, his name will be honoured in our lives, that others too may come to honour and love the name of Jesus. Amen.
Led like a lamb to the slaughter in silence and shame. There on your back you carry a world of violence and pain. Bleed in, dying. Bleed in. of course the uh, resurrection of Jesus that puts everything in a different perspective. He is Lord. He is risen. He will return. He rules and he reigns. Whatever is happening here on earth, God has not left the throne of heaven. Jesus stands at his right hand, King of kings and Lord of lords. That defines what faith is, being sure of what we don't see, being sure of what actually, in one sense, doesn't make sense. Scripture says, without faith, it is impossible to please God, because faith says, I place my trust in you and not in my understanding, not in my assessment of situations. Lord, I believe the old authorised version translates something of Job saying this, though he slay me, what? Yet I will trust him. That's a statement of faith. I'm going to lead in prayer now, and there's a call and response. So after each section, there's the phrase, Gracious Lord, wherever hatred seems to rule, if you could then say the words there on the screen. They'll remain on the screen while I, I pray, so you can look up occasionally just to remind yourself. Gracious Lord, wherever hatred seems to rule, may love emerge victorious. Let's pray. And so, our God, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus, knowing that because of his name you accept us and welcome us gladly. 
for we are yours. We have been called by name, even now, into your presence. Come, Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us, move within us, even as we pray. Jesus, risen Lord, we thank you for the victory of love over hatred that we celebrate over Easter. We praise you that you stayed true to your chosen path, despite all the malice thrown against you. The repeated taunts to put yourself first. Thank you that you overcame what must have been the very real temptation to have done just that. Hear now our prayer. Our prayer for the world that you gave your life for. A world so racked by enmity and division. With people so desperately, desperately in need of love. Gracious Lord, wherever hatred seems to rule, may love emerge victorious. We pray for those whose personal relationships have perhaps degenerated, and where there was once love, there is now hatred. Relationships scarred by Petty grievances and arguments, undermined by verbal or physical abuse, poisoned by coldness and indifference. Words that have been spoken to wound rather than to woo. Deeds designed to break down rather than build up. And all feeling and friendship long since forgotten. Gracious Lord, wherever hatred seems to rule, May love emerge victorious. We pray for society at large, where we see hatred sometimes masquerading under a variety of guises, whether that be prejudice, greed, selfishness, intolerance, ignorance, so much that denies, divides, and destroys, all that creates a hostile sense of them and us, the acceptable and the unacceptable. God forgive us, and gracious Lord, wherever hatred seems to rule, may love emerge victorious. We pray now for countries racked by inner tensions. And clearly we think of Ukraine and Russia, but also Afghanistan, Yemen, and other parts of the world. We pray for such countries who are at odds with their neighbours. Those torn apart by religious extremism or military dictatorship. Where there is racial hatred, where there is civil war or abuses of human rights. Where we see lives wantonly destroyed, families broken, communities shattered and even nations decimated. Let's pause for a few moments of stillness. Maybe that there are some thoughts, words, or images in your mind that you just now want to lay at the foot of the cross. Gracious Lord, wherever hatred seems to rule, may love emerge victorious. And so, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for this, our world, your world, in all its need. A world in which we see so much hatred, yet one which you loved so much you were willing to die for. And a word, world which you will never abandon, no matter how often your love is rejected. Help us and all peoples everywhere to recognize the folly of our sinful ways. Give us a clearer understanding that violence only breeds more violence, vengeance, more vengeance, bitterness, more bitterness, hatred, more hatred. <coughs> Give us the faith and the courage to live another way. The way that you revealed so powerfully through your death. The way of love. Gracious Lord, wherever hatred seems to rule, May love emerge victorious. 
We reach out in prayer and embrace those who are partners with us in mission. Pete and Lou, Judy, and others that may be of particularly known to you, Philippa. Lord, we pray that through your love within them and in their context that your love will emerge victorious in the lives of those amongst whom they live, to whom they witness by word and by deed. We pray for our own community here in the greater western area. And as the population here expands and grows, we pray that you will grant wisdom to churches to see exactly what needs doing and when, what to resource, what not to resource. We think especially of the Renew Wellbeing space in Whirl High Street, that through its ministry, people may come to realize, know, and revel in your love. For the work of CAP at the moment, as the number of clients increases, as people become more and more entwined in debt, we pray for Paul and the team here in Weston, that again, you will guide the right people to them and enable them to help others in their financial stress. Lord, may your love in us, through us, emerge victorious in the world. Around us, we pray. Amen. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples when Jesus passed by. John looked towards him and said, There is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When he turned and saw them following him, he asked, where, what are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent the rest of the day with him. It was then about four in the afternoon. One of the two who followed Jesus after hearing what John had said was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. The first thing he did was to find his brother Simon, said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is the Hebrew for Christ. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You should be called Kephas, that is, Peter, the rock. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He met Philip who, like Andrew and Peter, came from Bethsaida. And they said to him, Follow me. Philip went to find Nathanael and told him, We have met the man spoken of by Moses in the law and by the prophets. It is Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nazareth? Nathanael explained. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming, he said, Here is an Israelite worthy of the name. There is nothing false in him. Nathanael asked him, How do you come to know me? Jesus replied, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip spoke to you. Rabbi, said Nathanael, you are the son of God. You are king of Israel. Jesus answered, Is this the ground of your faith? But I saw you under a fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. Then he added, In truth, in very truth, I tell you, you shall see heaven wide open and God's angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. 
Your birth name, of course, was chosen for you. But what if you thought, hmm, I'd like a different name? What if you were to choose a new name for yourself? There's something going on here in the front row, I want to ask now. What would it be? And why? Or would you want to keep your present name? Or, if you are a parent, why did you choose the names you did for your child or your children? Good job, Helen and I had four boys. We never reached a similar consensus on possible names for a girl. So perhaps the good Lord knew we'd save an argument if we had four boys rather than a girl in the mix. Think back to school. For some of you longer than others, did you have a nickname? You don't tend to choose your own nicknames, do you? But somebody sort of fastens on a characteristic of some sort and the name can then stick. Um, the, the South Wales people, well, Wales, Welsh people in particular, are very good at um, having uh, nicknames for people. And of course, if somebody has the name uh, David and their surname David uh, Davis or David Jones or David Williams or whatever else, then you need some way of distinguishing between the various Davids. Well, David would normally um, get contracted to die. And so then uh, it would be die something or other. And uh, there was somebody who was known as Die Quiet Wedding. <laughs> you see, because he was a David who got married wearing plimsolls. He'd forgot to put his shoes on. Or daps, we call them daps in South Wales. Die Quiet Wedding. Throughout the rest of his life, that was how he was distinguished from other dies. And then there was Die Bad Chest. Now, Die Bad Chest, well, he was um, an undertaker. His actual name was Williams. But you see, um, other, other undertakers were also known as Die something, Die Coffin. So Die Coffin, Bad Chest. So that's how he became known as Die Bad Chest. And then there was the biology teacher, Die Section. I don't believe them. Oh, they're all true. I got a list of them. And then there was a Die 18 Months. Now, Die 18 Months was a front row rugby forward. And I don't know if you've noticed, but they tend to have cauliflower ears because the, there's some terrible things that go on in the front row of, of a rugby scrum and ears tend to get mutilated. Well, this particular chap, Die, he, he actually had half of one ear uh, bitten off. So he only had a year and a half. So he was known as Die 18 Months. These are all true, I have verified them. I kept a, a collection of them when I was in the South Wales Valleys and there are yet more that I could share with you but I will say for another time when you know I'm telling the truth. Okay, so nickname, yeah, there is some sort of characteristic that, I won't tell you my nickname by the way because I'd never hear the end of it. No, no. Yeah, you've got your own, yes, yeah, yeah. So, you know, but basically our, our names actually, they're important to us, aren't they? Um, our names are part of, of our self-identity, things that we uh, grow up with. There was nothing that used to cheese our boys off more than when you were trying to tell one of them off and you went through all the wrong names till you got to the right one, by which time they just gave you a withering look. Don't you even know my name, Dad? And of course, you've, you've lost the moment of authority and discipline, haven't you? But yeah, um, the, the correct name. If you were taking a funeral, it's important really to get the deceased names right. I remember a time when I was taking a funeral, and in the South Wales Valleys, you, you would take the, a funeral in somebody's best front room. Uh, the doors would be open, people would be up the stairs. It was usually women only in the house and men only at the graveside or at the crematorium. That tradition was breaking down by the time I'd finished in, in South Wales, but it still occasionally happened. And I remember fairly early on in, in my ministry um, that I was stood in that person's uh, room and I'd um, spoken to the, the widow. And then I called people together at the appropriate time, said, dearly beloved, we are gathered here together. And I mentioned the person's name, at which point people began to look at each other. I could see the look of horror on their face, thinking, the vicar's got the wrong name. And I thought, no, how could I do that? And, you know, I felt the sweat run in a cold stream down the, my, back, my back. I was in the right tears. Do you know what? I had got the right name. 
but his, this guy had a nickname by which everyone knew him, and they didn't know his real name. So I hadn't got it wrong, but I will never forget that horrible moment when I thought I'd got the name wrong at the start of a funeral service. After that, I always made sure when I went to visit a family for a funeral, I would ask, now, what name did they go by? Yeah. Because sometimes they would go by their middle name, and sometimes it, it would be, you know, a completely different name because it was the nickname they'd always had from since they were little in school, and that's how everybody knew them. After that one occasion, I always made sure I knew what a nickname had been given, just in case uh, when it came to a funeral service, there were people thinking I'd turned up at the wrong one. Yeah, names. Now, if we are remembered or mentioned uh, by name, well, that can be, you know, sometimes, yeah, that, that, that's nice. You know, um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm really good at remembering faces. I'm really good at remembering names, but sometimes I don't quite match them up. Um, you know, Joy Samantha, I mean, it sometimes happens, doesn't it? You know? and I want to find out what name she would like to be called by now. <laughs> But, um, yeah, it happens. The Apostle John, in his third letter, asks Gaius, to whom he is writing, to greet others by name. I hope to see you soon, he writes, and we will talk face to face and uh, not, not by Zoom. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. And Paul uh, greets a whole load of people by name in Romans chapter 16. Roger, weren't too glad I didn't ask you, ask you to read uh, Romans 16 in the first 12 verses, where Paul goes through a whole list of, of names of people. Greet so-and-so, and greet so-and-so, and those who meet at her house, etc., etc. The importance of names is there in the Christmas story. I've already referred to it in Matthew 1 and verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. What does the name Jesus mean? It means God saves. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus' name and Jesus' mission bound together. And again, a verse I referred to right at the start, salvation be, uh, is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to humankind by which we must be saved. And so, as we have in our worship, we have honoured the name of Jesus because it means so, so much. Jesus renamed Simon as Peter. Why? Did Jesus not like the name Simon? Apologies to any Simons here this morning. Did just, he didn't like it. So, ah, I'm not going to call you Simon. I'm going to call you something else. No. Simon is a good Hebrew name, meaning heard, or listening, or obedient. No, it's something else. Peter means rock, as we've already heard. And it had everything to do, this name change, with what Jesus intended to do in and through Peter in the future. Uh, Matthew uh, reveals that uh, when uh, after Math uh, Peter has declared, you are the Christ. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, when you name somebody, it sort of implies a sense of authority. It, it can also be used to bully people. You know that? Do you know that old phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me? It's not true. Names do hurt, and they can be used to, to bully. It implies that I have the right to call you by something else, and Jesus assumes that right when he comes across uh, Simon, who names him Peter. There's an assumption of authority there. Jesus was here putting down a marker with Simon. If he was going to be his disciple, then let's be clear about who's in charge. And having the right to rename someone is a clear declaration that Jesus was in charge in this relationship that would develop with Simon. It's clear from this who is going to call the shots in that relationship. It also marks a new beginning. There's something in this renaming about the past being left behind. 
about a new self-identity, a new self-image, a new sense of self-esteem. Come, follow me, Jesus said to him in Matthew 4, 19, and I will send you out to fish for people. I will make you fishers of men, as the old children's chorus going through in my head. I will make you fishers of men. How many of you know that one? Oh, yeah, we could have a sing song. If you follow me, yeah, come follow me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, says the Apostle Paul, right into the church in Corinth, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And so that is wonderfully encapsulated for this fisherman called Simon in being given the new name of Peter. Jesus was also not only assuming an authority and marking a new beginning, uh, but was also declaring an agenda. Simon was going to be changed. And over the course of the sermons that lie ahead in the future, God will, in the next few months, we'll explore that agenda that Jesus pursues with Simon into making him Peter. We'll see where it leads us and then also how it applies today. Um, think of uh, Simon's transformation um, from fisherman to apostle as a, a template, if you like, a pattern for how God calls all of us and works in each of us in terms of being called to be a disciple. And there were things that we will learn from Peter when he gets it horribly wrong, as well as he gets it wonderfully right. Sometimes we'll see ourselves in him. Sometimes we'll see, well, I'm not like him at all. Either way, there can be lessons that we can learn as through God's word and through the story of Simon Peter, God also calls us. Another great name change, of course, in the New Testament was of Saul, the per persecutor, to Paul, the apostle. At your conversion, whether it was gradual or all at once. Now, I don't think anybody looking around here was renamed when you became a Christian. Rather, you were given a new title to go with your name. You are looking at Saint Alan. Handsome or not, I'm a saint. Why is Helen laughing at this particular point? You see, uh, we often think, you know, St. Columbus, St. David, you know, special people. And that's very much a, a Roman Catholic thing where you have to be made a saint by decree of the Pope in Rome. That is not the New Testament position. The New Testament says that everyone who has faith in Jesus is given a new title. And that new title is saint. God's holy one saint. And being a saint tells us of the glorious privilege that is now ours in our being retitled, as it were, when we came to know Christ. This is our heavenly position in Christ. Let me take you just to a couple of verses in Colossians. First of all, 1 and verse 12. Paul there is saying, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of life. He's qualified you to be a saint. You don't qualify yourself. He qualifies you. He qualified me. And whereas the Pope has to see evidence of great holiness on earth before someone can call a saint, God looks at us in Christ and sees perfection and declares us to be a saint. Colossians 1 and verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy or sainted in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now, if I were to claim right now to be without blemish and free from accusation of sin now, then not only would Helen giggle at the thought, but you'd all be perfectly entitled to think differently. You see, the other side of the coin from my heavenly position where I'm recognized as a saint, is my earthly progress in holiness. In other words, God calls us to become what he's already declared that we are. 
You are a saint. That's our position before God in Christ. You are one of God's holy people. And when he looks at you, he sees no blemish, no sin, nothing. It's as if we've been, just as if we'd never been sinned at all in our lives, clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. In Christ, we are pristine and glorious and perfect. We are saints. And what God is doing in us and through us now is transforming us into that image day by day, moment by moment, working in us by the power of his Holy Spirit. Um, it's sometimes called sanctification, which is just a long word saying being sanctified. <laughs> this is our day-to-day -day discipleship to become on life, on earth, what we are already in heaven. Now, how Jesus discipled Simon Peter, how he grew in holiness is, as I said, what we'll be looking at uh, in the coming weeks. And so, along the way, let us remember that when we look at World Baptist Church, we are looking at a whole load of saints, a community filled with saints. So, if you're having a cup of tea, coffee afterwards, why not take up the call of the New Testament to greet one another by name, but greet one another with their title. Here's St. Peter here in front of me. Oh, that's made calf giggle now. <laughs> I think I might have to preach this sermon again until we get here. What do you think, St. Liz? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it's a bit of fun, but uh, let's, that's the theological, if you like, reality of who and what we are in Christ. So don't let the devil make us think that World Baptist Church isn't full of saints. It is, but we're all on that journey into living out what it means day by day. Yep, the title of this series is From Simon to Peter. You put your own name somewhere in that mix, whatever names you want, and see in that the journey on which, to which God calls us all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, for the new title that you've given to each and every one of us, we thank you. And Lord, we find it hard to get our heads around that we are saints. But that is what your word has declared, so we believe it. And so, Lord, we want to live lives that bring glory to your name. Forgive us for all that is unsaintly in us. And just as you moved Simon along the pathway till he was that great apostle of your church, characterized by holiness, so, Lord, continue to work in us to that agenda, we pray, changing us from one degree of glory to another, growing day by day in grace and in holiness. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our great high priest, who made an end of all our sin. Amen. I think that's what the Lord spoke to me and said that we are saints, and it's with a capital S, but the other letters are smaller. By the time we get to heaven, they'll all be capital letters. <laughs>
Yes, your goodness will lead us home. We thank you that you lead us, you guide us, we thank you for how you're going to lead us on. Dismiss us with your blessing upon us, O Lord, we pray. May we know your grace, mercy, and peace in super abundance, and all for the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.